up too close everybody behind the stage we need you to come in front of the stage can y'all lift up every sign that's out there so that the whole because it's time for a mass moral poor people's low wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington and to the polls. Can y'all shout till the walls tremble? Yeah. Are you all ready to hear some show now? Mom Monday singing? Yeah. All right, y'all, you know how we do it. Let's get it done. All right. Up over my head, see justice in the air and I really do believe a change is coming out there if you believe it put up a fist if you believe a change is coming out there come on and sing with us Put your hands together. 
you to do because this is a participatory thing I want you to say hey it's all love can you do that here we go hey it's all love let's try it out
say justice, we want, justice. we want, justice. when I say we want, you say health care, we want, healthcare. we want, healthcare. when I say we want, you say health care, we want, healthcare. we want, healthcare. when I say living, you say wages, living, wages. living, wages. when I say living, you say wages, living, wages. living, wages. when I say no more, you say war, no more, no more, when I say no more, you say war, no more. for a while, but you got to watch a Negro like me. Did you, no, 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 listen, you got to watch a Negro like me, because I'm allowed to come here anytime. Okay. Now, Mama, I know we ain't been out here for a while. Why don't y'all drop those signs? Because y'all know when we protest and when we go to jail, it's joy, and we bring it. We can be mad and sing ourselves right into a protest. That's how we do. So drop those signs and let's start rocking a little bit. Come on. Come on, let's start rocking. Now put those hands in the air and clap. Come on, come on. And it's 
of the matter is, we can't be silent. Now we are here today for one of the 12 mass mobilization rally and tours leading to Washington, D.C. in June. It was in April of 2013, right here, that we began with 50 people. We didn't call it Marl Monday then, we just were standing up trying to say something. And we walked into yonder building across the street and they arrested 17 of us for holding up pictures of the Constitution and scriptures from the Bible. It wasn't so much my arrest, it was the arrest of one lady who was had cerebral palsy in a wheelchair and they arrested her. At that time the extremists in the General Assembly and little did they know that that 17 would turn to 34, and that 34 would turn to 68, and so forth and so on, until a mighty movement began across this nation. Tonight, we we're in two places at one time. My dear sister, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, is with folk in Wisconsin, and they are starting uh, right, we're gonna leave here and go live there. And so, the first thing we want to do is certainly say to everybody be COVID safe. For our team, we need somebody up here that has uh, spray uh, so that whenever we are, the one speaker comes, it can be sprayed. 
We also need everybody. Y'all know how mama, nobody gets to stay behind the stage and laugh and talk. So y'all need to tell them that over there. Because if we can't pay attention to one another, how in the hell we think we're going to get the nation to pay attention? So if you, if you over there talking, come on now. We have to have a level of movement discipline, right? No need to be mad if other folk don't listen to you if you don't listen to yourself. And so we want to have that person, whoever's going to be helping uh, to make sure we're COVID safe. We have a dear sister that's coming uh, to give us instructions on how things will work in terms of translation, because we try to make sure everybody is included. We're not out, we didn't know it would be cold today, but we're not out here in this cold for no fellowship. We might sing, but don't get it twisted. Our hearts are hurting. We are righteously angry because somebody's hurting our brothers and sisters and it's gone on far too long. First gonna be impact. We always do that in the, in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is impacted persons speak first. The religious leaders are gonna come and do a litany and then persons impacted directly will come and then I'm gonna come back at the end as we are Reverend Liz to try to bring it all together and connect it to what's happening because the goal of our movement is not to from DC down, it's from North Carolina, Mississippi, Wisconsin up. It's the people up, right? So at this time, would she come? Hi everyone, I'm Andreina. I'm here with Tilde Language Justice Cooperative. I'm a co-interpreter, Ron, who's somewhere out there. And if you will be doing English to Spanish interpretation, so if you need to hear the speeches in Spanish, you need to call a number. I'm going to slowly say that number now. Feel free to put in your phone in case a friend comes up might need Spanish interpretation. It's 720 720-820-1525. 720-820-1525. One five two five. If you want to hear the speeches in Spanish, or if it's in Spanish now. Hola, mi nombre es Andreina y estoy aquí con la cooperativa de lenguaje Tilde y mi co-intérprete Ron que está por ahí en la audiencia. Si quieren escuchar eh, las palabras que van a decir hoy en español, pueden marcar al número que voy a decir ahora lentamente y vamos a estar proporcionando interpretación simultánea al español. El número es siete dos cero. 820-1525, lo voy a repetir, 720-820-1525 para escuchar en español. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Hello, Mom Monday. Rob Stevens, uh, Deputy Director for June 18th, and uh, thrilled to be here with all of uh, you family for this important uh, movement moment. Uh, at this time, we're going to invite two of our faith leaders, our prophetic voices in the state of North Carolina, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Nancy Petty, Reverend Pastor Wesley Morris. Amen. Bless Moral Monday, everybody. Now, in order to raise the temperature, you got to raise the love. I said, Bless Moral Monday, everybody. All right. I'm here with my friend, Reverend Dr. Nancy Petty. We will be leading you in the litany today. And in order for that to work, we're going to need you to repeat this phrase when we finish our statements. Y'all got me? Yes. Y'all got us? Yeah. You got each other? Yeah. All right. This phrase is, we need a meeting. We need a meeting. So when we point at you after we read the statement, need to hear you say, we need a meeting. Let's practice that one more time. We need a meeting. All right. We're going to raise the temperature on our representatives with this one. Because the promise of our democracy requires that we address the interlocking injustices of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, 
and the war economy and the false narrative of religious nationalism because our politics are trapped by the lies of scarcity, which are fueled by trickle-down economics and Christian nationalism, these politics turn us against each other and blame the poor for their poverty, even though we live in a time of abundance. Because nearly one million people have died from the coronavirus, Millions of workers have been called essential while being treated as expendable, and millions more are facing low wages, unemployment, eviction, hunger, and the denial of health care. Because there were 140 million poor and low wealth people before the pandemic, and 250,000 people died every year, or about 700 people every day, because of poverty and inequality, while a billionaire wealth is at an all-time high, and even during the worst economic and public health crisis of a generation, because voter suppression hurts millions, we are living through an historic crisis of democracy and voting rights are under attack in nearly every state. Voter suppression targets people of color and undermines the right of vote of women, youth, the elderly, and the poor. Keep raising that temperature. You're going to hold off, though, on that we need a meeting right now to the end. So just hang on. I'm going to read some things. I got instructions from the bishop over here. <laughs> Because poor and low wealth people make up one third of the electorate, but are not centered in our politics and our policies. However, poor and low wealth people are a sleeping giant that when awakened will shift not just one election, but all of our national priorities. Yeah. Yes. Because the co climate crisis is devastating our communities and our planet with poor and low wealth people hit first and worst by raging fires and floods, drought and pollution. Our homes and our holy sites are being mined and poisoned and destroyed because war itself is an enemy of the poor everywhere. There is nothing just about a nation that has spent $21 trillion on war, policing, surveillance, and prisons over the past 20 years amid widespread poverty and economic insecurity. Because far too long, Tim Tyson, poor people and people of color indigenous nations and immigrant families and women and children and the disabled and the LGBTQIA communities have been under attack, pitted against each other, and blamed for society's problems. And because on June 18th, we will not simply curse the darkness, but demonstrate our compelling power to right the wrongs of society. And together, under the leadership of Bishop Barber and Reverend Theo Harris and others, we must bring about a third reconstruction to realize the nation we have yet to be. Assembly, Assembly and moral, and moral. March, March on Washington, on Washington. And, to the polls. and to the polls. Thank you, Brother Reverend Wesley, yes. Reverend Dr. 
Nancy Petty. But we promised on that day that the stage will never be about people speaking for people. It'll be about people speaking for themselves. The only way you can change the narrative is you've got to change the narrator. We've said that even to the president and others, you can't pass plans and then not allow the people who you claim you're passing the plan for not to talk about why the plans need to be passed. Otherwise, it just becomes a conversation between the politicians, and that ain't going to never turn out right. So today we have impacted persons, and we have one addition, and Reverend Cardis Brown. I know he's a reverend, but he wants to talk very specifically about how he was impacted, and you might not think it, right? Uh, and how he says, if I was impacted, what in the world is happening to people who didn't, who didn't have a church like I have or didn't have the resources I have? And so these persons are coming from South Carolina, from Virginia, from North Carolina. By the way, this is not just North Carolina. It's North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and South Carolina. Somebody give it up. And each of them are going to take two minutes and talk about being impacted and then say why they are mobilized. And at the end of their thing, we've asked across the nation that people not clap, but instead shout, somebody's been hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. Practice that. Say, somebody's been hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. And y'all, if you're anywhere around near the mic, if you would keep that going at the end, at the end, rather than hand claps, we want to shout that so that people, by the way, we have thousands of people online from all over the country and all over the world right now. Thousands of you have showed up here. So they'll come now in their own way. Shannon Waite from South Carolina, Alisa White from Starbucks, we're in Raleigh, Tim Platt, the Amazon worker, Sakia Royal, Goldsboro, Reverend Della Owens, impacted by health care, Oscar Panetti, immigration and poverty, Sangria Nobles, voting rights, Bishop Tanya Rawls will come to call for the LGBT community, T.J. Thompson, Virginia, Veterans for Peace, Bobby Jones, impacted by environmental injustice, and then Reverend Cardis Brown will come in that order and share with us. Say, somebody has been hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. Let me make one, one correction. I just saw Anna in the corner of my eye. I'm getting a little old. I wasn't as old as 2013. But I know that the, the tri-chairs want to come and say why they are mobilizing and recognize the tri and say hello to all the other court. There are 37 states now that have coordinating committees that weren't existent two and a half years. We've been working, y'all, building from the bottom up. So y'all come first and say why as tri-chairs, you all are giving everything you have to mobilize, and then after them, Sister Shannon Wake will start us.
we moved on and expanded the job employment opportunities, all sorts of things. I won't go through the whole thing, y'all know. But we cannot stop. We cannot stop. We have to love each other, believe that you can do it. Because we've done it before, and we're going to do even greater things moving forward. So forward together. So Blackbird is a real honor to be back home with Moral Monday. It's a homecoming. We want you all to get energized because we have issues that we have to address. And it is because of those issues that I stand before you and organize and mobilize. So we want you to remember to do more. Mobilize. I did double work for half the pay of Google's direct hires. 
At AWU, we continue to fight for and organize around workers' rights, such as equal pay for equal work, ending the TVC system, and issues around harassment and discrimination. Most of Google's workforce comprises a diverse array of workers who make on average $15 an hour or less with no benefits, usually marginalized folks from rural areas who are in intentionally excluded from Google's supposed high standards of pay and benefits. All workers at Google deserve the power of a union. Big tech is seeing a wave of unionization efforts as a sequel to yesterday's intersectional labor movement. Workers such as Miss Louise Brown standing right here next to me from the 1969 Charleston Hospital Workers Strike <laughs> built the structures built the structures in place to enhance the lives of so many workers across the industry that dominates the global workforce. Workers must organize to win back their surplus labor value and maintain an ethical workplace. Let's move forward together on June 18th in DC as we fight to organize our communities all. Somebody's hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. I started organizing a union campaign at my store here, Starbucks, on Wake Forest and Six Forks Road. One of the main reasons we are organizing is for better wages. Instead of investing in their workers who brought them record-breaking profits during the pandemic, corporate chose to invest in an almost 40% compensation increase for our CEO. Kevin Johnson was paid over $20 million this past year while they cut benefits such as our hazard pay. The average barista in this state was being paid under $10 an hour. Starbucks did eventually provide a raise this past fall that brought baristas in this state to $12 an hour, but guess what? The estimated living wage for Raleigh is $16.32. That's how much a single person would need to live comfortably, and it is more than double the current minimum wage in North Carolina. It is absolutely unacceptable for a company that made just under five billion dollars this past year to have the people who are responsible for that profit living paycheck to paycheck they announced that sometime this summer they will start paying us 15 an hour and while i am glad that that increase is coming many other workers in this state work for businesses unwilling to do the same they are not being paid what they need to live a major motivator for me in organizing my store is that it might inspire both Starbucks partners and other workers in this state. Once we win, and I look forward to carrying that momentum into our march in DC this summer to remind our politicians of our right to a living wage. Thank you. Somebody's hurting our workers. And it's gone on far too long. Be silent anymore. And I understand that y'all want to clap. I do. I really get it. But when people are talking about their pain, it ain't nothing to clap about. If you're hurt, what it, what it is something to do is shout about. So if somebody tells you that their pain and people are not paying them, when they get at the end of that, if we would join in one chorus, somebody's hurting our people. And it's gone on, it's gone on. Far, too far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. Silent. Every movement must have message discipline. Now, now one thing that y'all can say, we can say about Trumpites and folk, even though they be lying, they will tell the same lie. Over and over and over again. Well, if lie can tell the lie, we can say a truth. So y'all want sooner that somebody hurting our brothers and sisters. Gone on far too long. We won't be silent anymore. Then if you want to lift up a mighty clap, do that, okay? But make sure we say that so that the whole nation, I just heard thousands more have joined us. So we want to make sure they get a clear message. Amen?
All right. So working at Amazon, I found the Safe Use Fulfillment Center very different from how it's painted in the media. Out of necessity, many full-time workers at Amazon have side gigs, Uber and Lyft stickers on their cars, people sleeping overnight in the warehouse parking lot because of being temporarily homeless. Some you can see committed to work on foot at one of the most profitable companies in the world. Here are the numbers. Amazon along with Apple and Microsoft make up one fifth of the S&P 500. But guess what? Amazon warehouse workers did that. Amazon recorded record profits during the pandemic, but guess what? Amazon warehouse workers did that. Amazon made net profits of $33.6 billion in 2021. Amazon workers, you built that. The lack of social, social vision, the crime against these men and women with pay that would statistically lead the majority of these workers to a future of no property, little to no assets, and a life, dependency, life of dependency, which is despair. It's a shame because these Amazonians, not only do they deserve better, they've already earned it. They put in the work. We built the very foundation of which Amazon stands on. A lot of us could have jumped ship, but we found our cause. Without Amazon workers, this country's economy would grind to a halt. We aren't quitting. We are using our leverage. We are organizing. It's not, yes, we can, that was 08. In 2022, it's yes, we will. It's yes, we will. We are building our own table at Amazon Corporate. You will meet us there. Yeah. Amazonians, join the cause and join us in D.C. on June 18th. Thank you. Somebody's hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't. Good evening, comrades. My name is Sakia Royal, and I am a health worker for state facilities here in North Carolina, and I am also the president of a public service workers union, UE Local 150. And I am also part of the coordinating com committee for the Southern Workers Assembly. Our union represents city and state workers and private sector workers across the state of North Carolina. Workers here in North Carolina and across the South are in a major, major crisis. We have carried these cities and states throughout the years and have always been essential workers. But the blow of the pandemic have finally highlighted the critical roles in society that we play and yet we still don't get this respect that we deserve with a dignified wage and safety on our jobs. I see why major corporations are bringing their companies here to North Carolina. They're getting some of the biggest tax breaks in the country and paying the lowest wages in the country. The, the, the state of North Carolina just lowered taxes again this year for the corporations and the wealthy. These are critical resources to fund our schools, hospitals, roads, and all public services that are our safety nets to protect us um, for our basic needs. Uh, public workers are facing additional hurdles with the ban on collective bargaining. This is a law that was passed during segregation, and I cannot believe that it's still allowed to be on the books today in 2020. We are proud of our sisters and brothers in Virginia who won collective bargaining for their local government workers last year. North Carolina is one of the only two city states in, that are still banned public sector workers from negotiating contracts. Because we need help to build our statewide movement and win collective bargaining rights for all workers, 
We fight back by building worker power. We fight back by building unions and workers' assemblies in our workplaces and in our communities. UE150 will be mobilizing our members to join the Poor People's Campaign on June 18th in December. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. All right, give it up for all these amazing speakers from across the South. Coming together. We're going to now have Reverend Dr. Della Owens, who's going to come speak to us now about uh, health care and justice in that arena. Then it'll be followed by Oscar Pineda and Sangria Noble. Good evening. Good evening. I am the Reverend Dr. Della Owens. I'm a pastor, and I am the National Director of Safety and Security for Repairs of the Breach. But today, today I'm not serving in that capacity. I am standing with you today as an impacted person who have lived with lupus for over 35 years when I was diagnosed. And having lived with it, I have lived with insurance companies and corporations having the power to deny me and many thousands of, of others who live with this life of disease, and they struggle every day thinking about how they're going to get their medicine. And because of government policies that protect corporations and insurance companies and force people like me, myself, and others with this chronic deadly disease to make decisions whether or not they're going to eat or pay their bills, we cannot afford this any longer. And they literally force us to make those decisions, life choices decisions, between life and death. I serve as the Wake County co-facilitator for the Lupus Support Group. And every month I sit with women who discuss and share with me their stories. In this state alone, 55,000 people live with lupus and 1.5 million across this United States. Those who live with this, the government have not shown mercy to us but yet there have been mercy shown to insurance companies. And even if you have insurance, they still would deny paying our bills, paying medical treatments that you need when the doctors recommend that you need this treatment. But I understand that there is gonna be a meeting in June 18th. And we plan to be there on June 18th. Thank you. Somebody's hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. Hello, everyone. My name is Sol Pertineda. I am originally from El Salvador, but currently I am a resident of North Carolina. I define myself as a 22 year old Latino, queer, and undocumented immigrant. I was forced to leave my country due to poverty and violence as a Latino queer. Immigrants contribute greatly to the development of this country. We contribute millions in taxes and social security. I have witnessed and experienced firsthand how hard people in my community work. And regardless of how many hours we work or jobs we have, our economic situation almost never allowed us to rise from poverty. In fact, our community is kept in the shadows, oppressed, and disenfranchised while simultaneously this nation hunts us down like dogs by sending eyes into our communities and ripping children from their parents' arms while our families are torn apart. That is immoral and inhumane. No human being should be okay with this. We need an immigration reform and a path to citizenship for the 11 million of undocumented immigrants in this nation and the over 309,000 undocumented immigrants in North Carolina, because that is justice for all we have given to this country. Yeah. I represent El Colectivo and El Centro Hispano, and I am mobilizing my Latino and immigrant community, and asking you to join me in Washington, D.C. on June 18th yes. for the Mass for People's and Loud West Workers' Assembly. Forward together! Hello everyone, my name is Sangrenova. 
I'm a 44 year old black female woman. Um, I'm a mother of five beautiful children. I am a senior in the North Carolina Department of, I'm sorry, senior at North Carolina ANT State University. Thank you, Pride. I'm a taxpayer, and I'm also a North Carolina Second Chance Alliance coordinator with NC4 Justice. But overall, I am very much directly impacted by the North Carolina injustice system. Um, as I reflect back to 2007, prior to being incarcerated or locked up, um, I never really looked at my rights, because I'm, I'm in the world as a, a human just doing, just doing whatever, you know, instead of a human being. You know, so I never really looked at my rights. But after being over, you know, over there at NCCIW for, for three years, Mount Misery, you know, Mount Misery, that's what it was. It, it, it's traumatizing, it's traumatizing. So, so for it to be a traumatizing situation for a single mom with, with children that made a, 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 a petty mistake, you know, I was stripped of my rights. When I got out, I was stripped of my rights, my rights to vote, my rights for education, my rights for adequate housing. You know, it, it, it was, I, I felt kind of inhuman. It, it, it was a trap. You know, I, I, I get out of prison and there's no transitional home for me to go to because I have one child over the age of 12 years old, so we can't go together as a family. So that, you know, that, that placed me back at the same spot where I just left. But I was strong, you know. I was strong. I had to be strong because the system is designed to keep us locked down. You know, even even after, you know, being locked up, I still have to wait a year to qualify for public housing. That's what the housing authority told me, you know. Um, other than that, you know, other things like probation fees, attorney fees, uh, a court costs, restitution. Why, why would I have to pay $30 a month when I just went and did three years in the prison? Where am I going to get that from? I'm a convicted felon. No one will hire me due to the rules and regulations that the government has set up for us. You know, it's all a, a trap. Even upon completing my probation, upon completing my probation, I had to wait two months to get this paper right here well, that I says... I got a question for you. That's right. Are you going to join with all these folks on June 18th? Yes, I'm going to join with all these folks. Are you going to mobilize for June 18th? I'm going to mobilize. Are you going to mobilize? I'm going to mobilize. Are you going to mobilize? I'm going to mobilize. Come on, somebody. Mobilize. mobilize. I got to let the people know that by, Ford Justice just sent me a message. 55,000 people just got their voting rights back. Yeah. Tanya Rawls, and I am an out proud lesbian resident of North Carolina. I thank God so much for my wife, Gwendolyn, partners for 23 years. And we live in a state where our rights and our lives are often under attack. I am here today because it is my turn to stand for justice, freedom, and equality like so many did for me. So much blood has been shed and so many lives lost because there are those who believe that they and they alone have a right to the fruit of this land God gave to us all. I am here today because those who enact laws and establish policies that disenfranchise LGBTQ people, the poor, marginalized, and others must be held accountable and stopped. My reflection uh, my, when reflecting on the fact that the state, a state like North Carolina has more than 4.6 million people living at or below the poverty line, many of those people do identify as LGBTQ. I thought of how close my Sunday sermon was to the experiences of so many in our state and nation today. 
It was about the story of Lazarus and told by Jesus in Luke chapter 16 about a destitute man with a chronic health condition that led to open ulcers all over his body. He sat at the gate of the General Assembly. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, at the gate of the rich man's house. All right? And, 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 and he was begging for crumbs that fell from the table behind the gate he sat at. The legislators, oh no, I'm sorry, the rich man and his friends would walk by that man and not offer the medical care that was available behind the gate. Not offer him the crumbs he begged for from their table, or better yet, a bag of groceries or a living wage so that they could get his own food. No one asked if he had safe housing or the resources needed to live a quality life. Those who have a moral obligation to help just turn their backs. Dogs came and licked the sores to offer him comfort since no one else would stop, would step by and help him. I am here today because I don't want dogs standing for me and offering the support that we have a right and responsibility morally to offer to the marginalized. We will not turn back and on June the 18th, we will be in Washington standing strong. Forward together, not one step back. Just a, a, a few more speakers here who are going to come. The first is going to be T.J. Thompson coming to us from the great state of Virginia, from Veterans for Peace. He'll be followed by Bobby Jones, Deacon Bobby Jones from Goldsboro, North Carolina, speaking on environmental justice, and followed by Reverend Dr. Cardez Brown of Greensboro, New Life Missionary Baptist Church. Come now. I'm T.J. from Chesapeake, Virginia, and a veteran for peace. I grew up in a trailer park around, along the northeastern border of the Great Dismal Swamp with our right-wing evangelical church at the entrance. We neighbored a shipyard that services the largest naval base in the world in Norfolk. These facilities also provide the most jobs in the area and are surrounded by poverty and desolation. We worship God, guns, and our right-wing evangelical idol, Pat Robertson in Virginia Beach. Escaping these shipyards, I thought, I enlisted in the Navy. Stationed near Chicago during my first year, one night in the city, I experienced head trauma through police brutality. Reaching my ship, USS Portland, in 2001, I asked to see a psychiatrist, which was stigmatized in the military. When my command refused to discharge me because of my psychiatrist's recommendation, I had my first suicide attempt. I was and still am married to my high school sweetheart. We were starting our family, yet I resigned to being a shell of a person. By 2009, I became active with Veterans for Peace and About Face. 2011, I was back on pills and had a second suicide attempt. I learned Buddhist meditation and other ways to cope and live my life. Organizing in the Veterans Peace Movement brought me to the Poor People's Campaign. Where my traumas in poverty, militarism, and extreme nationalism came into view. As I conclude, the Warhawks swarm seeking further division. We must remain vigilant and avoid becoming their prey. In 2003, off the coast of Iraq, many of my fellow veterans and I participated in a role like Russia and Ukraine today. We must stand in international solidarity with the masses in Ukraine. We must also recognize the importance of nonviolence. With victory our deadline, we must march together to D.C. on June 18th and beyond, obliterating poverty, racism, nationalism, militarism, and ecological devastation locally, nationally, and internationally. Forward together! Somebody's hurting our veterans. 
and it's gone on. And we won't be Hello, hello. I'm Bobby Jones from Down East Coax Environmental Social Justice Coalition in Goldsboro. Yes, Bobby. From the six million tons of poisonous coal ash on the west side of our county to the CAFOs and hog lagoons on the east side, Duke Energy, Dominion Energy, and Smithfield Foods have turned some of our communities into bitter dumping grounds. Duke Energy started dumping poisonous coal ash and unlined pits in the 50s, and they didn't stop until 2012 when they switched over to gas. Oh, how, how good that was. The heavy metal poison from the coal ash poisoned the groundwater, the drinking water, and was released into the Noose River. After Hurricane Matthew in 2016, and then Hurricane Florence in 2018, two 500 year floods in less than two years, we realized that we had a problem. And we partnered with North Carolina EJ Collective and the Black Workers for Justice to start the Goldsboro Resilience Hub to prepare and support community members around these climate disasters. Yeah. On October the 26th, 2021, Duke Energy started reburning the already poisonous coal ash. Now, in addition to poisoning the water, Duke Energy is putting more poison in the air. Research reflects the presence of harmful bacteria downstream from the hog lagoons, especially after rainfall. And the air surrounding CAFOs has ammonia, hydrogen sulfate, methane, and particulate matter. The cumulative impacts of burning coal ash and methane for over 60 years and decades of unlined animal waste lagoons have left eastern North Carolina in a troubling situation. The largely BIPOC and poor white communities that have been relegated to living in these compromised communities have had to endure poisonous and nauseous living conditions, sickness and even death. They have longed for justice, removal of the coal ash, removal of the lagoons. Duke Energy, I invite all of you to join us in Washington, D.C. Somebody! How sweet it is to be in the presence of those who believe in morality. For we are experiencing so much immorality. I'm standing today experientially to tell you about my own experience in being privileged of God to receive a kidney. Now to some of you that might not mean much, but for those who are out there, and I know you are, who suffer with diabetes and other chronic illnesses, we know that we are always subject to the cruelties that are imposed by those who have really made a decision to selectively decide who lives or dies. I got to tell you, at a moment when I thought my time had come, the grace of God provided a young lady who gave me a life-giving gift. And seven years now, I have been able to continue to declare the word of God because of that generosity. But how can you ever think about being so blessed to receive such a gift without thinking about the millions who never have that. Only because of the cruelties of those who have the power to make it happen. I ask you to join me in the fight to give life to many who have lost hope because of those who are in power to make the decision. I believe that as we get together on the 18th of June, a thunderous voice will be heard of unanimity, where we will say, forward together and not one step back. God bless you all.
hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. My brothers and sisters, as we gather here, getting ready to go to Wisconsin, these gatherings, and y'all can come up some, those of you behind, if there's some other clergy, this is not about speaking competitions. Everybody here had a story. And the Bible tells us that in order for there to be a movement, there must be a certain sound. You can't have folk all over the place. And so I want us to gather in as I try for a few minutes to lay out what's happening across this country. Because the question is, and where's my dear sister that was incarcerated? The question is, what do we do with all of this? What do we do with all of this? It's a rhetorical, what do we do with all this? Where's my, she said, Reverend, she was in the back shouting, she said, I never thought I would be even allowed to talk. What do we do with all of this pain, all of this hurt? See, see, we know the facts. 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country before COVID, 43% of all adults, 52% of all children, some of you sisters stand with this sister. I'm a pastor, I, I'm a pastor at heart. I don't let people cry alone. 87 million people uninsured or underinsured. 700 people dying a day before COVID. A quarter million people dying a year from poverty before COVID. How do you do with this, Bishop Rawls? When you know it, 44% of all people in North Carolina, poor and low wealth, before COVID, 4.6 million residents, 53% of our children, 58% of black people, 1.2 million people, 2.2 million white people, 68% of Latinos. What do you do with all of this? Two million people in this state making less than a living wage. Over 50% of the workforce in this state in the 21st century, less than $15 an hour. A million people in North Carolina uninsured. And the legislature with one vote could give 500,000 people health care through Medicaid expansion. But they won't do it because their hatred for Obama, but more important, their dislike for poor and low wealth people. Then we go over to Tennessee. 38% of all the people in Tennessee poor and low wealth. 1.3 million people making less than $15 an hour. 670,000 people without insurance go to Virginia. 40% of Virginians poor and low wealth. 3.3 million people. 1.4 million making less than a living wage. 710,000 without health care go to West Virginia. 750,000 people are poor and low wealth. 689,000 of them white. 300,000 making less than a living wage, over 50%, over 100,000 uninsured. What do you do with these stories? What do you do with these pains? What do you do? That's the question. And so, wait a minute, I'm finished. You're hollering before you got all the facts. 21,000. 21 million people, 21, excuse me, 21,000 people dying every day from poverty in the world, according to the Oxfam report. Next week, we are releasing a report to talk about facts so devastating that I can't even talk about it right now because the economists are redoing the numbers because 
They say, we can't be doing this to people. And we say, yeah, we knew the anomalies. We knew the, the excuse me, we knew the, the, the stories. But now the data, Al, is saying they're not anomalies. In the Poor People's Campaign, one person that we know who marches with us begged us to allow her to keep marching because during COVID, she lost 21 members of her family in a 30 mile radius. And so next week, we're gonna release a report at the National Press Club that says whatever pain Americans have received from this pandemic, poor and low wealth people and communities have experienced more. What do you do when you know that Columbia University did a study and in that study they said upwards of 60% of the people that died did not have to die. They only died because our systems of care were not more robust and compassionate and because we did not follow the science. I'm looking for y'all right here because I'm going to need her in a minute. This evening, you've heard what this really means for people. That's what we want the nation to hear. We want the nation to hear herself, the people. Now in the Bible, the prophets spoke to society at times of gross inequality. And the prophets knew, Reverend Nelson, that there's sometimes that things are so bad, but there's so much cover up. In order for people to get it, you've got to change your language. So in Amos chapter five, for instance, the prophet says, and this is the message translation for my rabbi brothers and sisters, people hate this kind of talk. Raw truth is never popular, but here it is. Things look good on the outside, but you run roughshod over the poor. You take bread right out of their mouth. And because of that, you're never going to really move into the luxurious houses that you built in the nation. God told Amos to say, I know precisely the extent of your violations and the enormity of your sins. Listen at this. This is over. Oh, this is in in 2600 BC. Uh, uh, the, the enormity of your excuse me, 600 BC. You bully people, and you take bribes, Tim, Tim, on the right and the left. Oh God, that's in the Bible. It says some people have started thinking that justice is a lost cause, and evil is epidemic. But then God says to Amos, I need you to seek good and not evil. And since this nation says God is your best friend, start acting like it in your public policy. I need some folk that will hate evil and love good and then work it out in the public square. Then verse 16 says, God says, I need a remnant of folk. I don't need everybody, I don't need every family, but I need a remnant that'll go in the street and cry loudly and fill the malls and the shops and will weep in public and declare not me, not us, not now. I need a remnant, somebody shout remnant, that will empty the offices and the stores and the factories and the workplaces. I need a movement that will call people to a general lament and will cry in the public square. And then God says, I want to hear it so loud that I am convinced you don't like what you see happening. Because you know, this ain't, and then God says, and then I'll visit you and I'll help you. But I ain't gonna help you till you cry. And I'm not gonna help you till you get in the public and cry in the street. You know Amos sound like Zora Neale Hurston. 
that great prophet poet of the of the Harlem Renaissance when Zora Neale Hurston said if you smile when people are hurting you they'll kill you and say you enjoy Lord have mercy and so there comes a time you got to shift your thinking Amos went on to say said God said I hate your meetings your religious meetings and I hate your fundraising schemes and I hate your public relations stuff what I want you to do is let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream there are moments that you gotta change your language I was reading the other night a writer from the 19th century can I can I say it like I feel it and this writer said that he came up with a term called social murder. And he says, and this was in 1845, he said that when one individual inflicts bodily harm on another, such that death results, we call that manslaughter. When another assailant knows in advance that what they're going to do will be fatal, we call that murder. But when society places hundreds of people in such a position that they inevitably meet a too early and unnatural death, one which is quite as much a death by violence as by the sword, because it deprives thousands of the necessary things of life and places them under conditions in which they cannot live. The writer says, this too is murder. Just as surely as a single individual killing somebody. But it's disguised. It's a malicious kind of murder. It's a murder against which none can defend, which does not seem like it because no man sees the murderer. Because the deaths of the victim seem natural since the offense is more one of omission than commission, but it's murder, just the same. Social murder is not about left versus right. It's about right versus wrong. You ask Leslie, isn't it murder? When somebody's child dies because the government refuses to provide health care for everybody. And yet the ones that are denying the health care, they get free health care just because you elected them. Oh, God, help me somebody. They go to Congress and they get free health care just because they got elected. How in the hell are you going to deny somebody health care when we paying your health care? Dr. King said we commit they don't like this part of Dr. King. He said psychological murder. Every time you deny somebody of a job or a living wage. Coretta Scott King called it violence. She said violence isn't just killing my husband with a deer rifle. Violence is denying living wages. Violence is denying health care. Violence is denying education. Violence is denying for affordable housing. Yeah. Violence is denying culture. Yeah. And then she said, an apathetic attitude that won't say anything about it, that's violence too. Yeah. 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 Isaiah said, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. Ezekiel one time said, your politicians have become like wolves and they are using the people as prey. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't get scared. We, but we got to change the language. Huh? After COVID, we are more clear that we need social movements. We got to have it. And in truth, even the Declaration of Independence says this. The Declaration of Independence says, after there's been a long train of abuses, says you don't, you don't change easy, but when there's been a long train of abuses, 
It is the right of the people. It is the duty of the people to alter the course of the nation and its function. The truth, my brothers and sisters, I said a few years ago when I was standing before some 60 million people that America needed a, a, a defibrillator and we needed to shock the heart of America and we needed to revive the heart of America. But after COVID and after looking at the ways in which after COVID and after nearly a million deaths and we still can't give people health care and we still can't give people a living wage and we still I'm talking about what they can't do listen and we still can't give people what is a human right what the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 said ought to be fundamental we don't need to shock the heart we need a heart transplant And the truth is, this ain't new for America. Often down through history, America has needed to have a heart transplant. That's what the 13th Amendment was, a transplant. You can't just shock the heart over slavery, you got the end. The 14th Amendment, transplant. 15th Amendment, transplant. 19th Amendment, transplant. You, you, you can't have a country and call it a democracy and say if you, if you don't have land, you can't vote. And if you're not white, you can't vote. And if you, and if you have a different gender, you can't vote. There had to be a transplant. The labor movement of the late 18th, 19th century, and it was a transplant. The Second Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Movement, transplant. My point is, sometimes a heart needs more than a shock. Sometimes you don't revive an old heart. You got to take out the stony heart. Two years of this pandemic have proven it. And so my brothers and sisters, we've sit here and we've watched politicians write policies. These two years that allowed corporations and, and, and billionaires to make $2 trillion in less than 20 months. Y'all hear what I said? Billionaires' income has increased 70% while 8 million more people fell into poverty. Do you hear what I'm saying? Even after COVID, we call people essential workers. Before COVID, they were service workers. We call them essential workers and then treated them like they were expendable and sent them out to work and they were the first to get sick, the first to die. We're finding out every day it wasn't all accidental. And so we gotta have a fundamental change because when the body is dying, you gotta change the heart. And we must be clear for this kind of change, an insurrection motivated by white supremacy and greed can't change the heart. Hate and violence Joyce can't change the heart. You start out with hate, you try to do hate, you're gonna kill everything. Neoliberalism that says if you help the middle class, everybody else is gonna be okay, can't change the heart. Trickle down economics that says give all of it to the top and they'll let a little come off the bottom. That's not gonna change the heart. If you're gonna change the heart, you gotta have a movement. And so I went to a friend of mine who's a heart specialist. And I asked him about the procedure to change hearts. And he said, Barbara, to change a heart, you gotta do several things. You gotta know how to do it without killing the body. He said every, and that's why every heart transplant begins with a serious meeting where you bring everybody together because you also got to figure out if the body can even take a heart transplant. How bad is it? Can it take it? And when you do it, you gotta have everybody. Because you can't transplant a heart 
by yourself. Yes. There's got to be a meeting. Yes. And I've been watching Bishop Rawls over the last few months, how the stories in the Ukraine, the more people see it and hear it, the more people are coming together. And what that says to me is, if folk could just see in America what's really going on, if people could hear what's really going on, then just maybe the body could take a transplant and we could see change. And so that's why we gathered here tonight. That's why we've been crisscrossing the country. That's why we're lifting up the voices of the people. That's why they're calling for a mass poor people's low wage workers assembly tomorrow march on Washington and to the polls June 18th. That's why we understand it's not a day, but a declaration. Somebody's got to hear about all this murder. Somebody's got to hear about all these pain, this pain. We've got to break the heart of the nation until the nation wants to accept a transplant of the heart. We've got to do it. And after I talked to my friend, as I was leaving, the Holy Ghost got me. God, through the Spirit, said, you didn't have to go to the doctor. You could have just talked to me and talked, listen to my word. Because I've always done heart transplant. I've always, and I've always done it by having a meeting. Everywhere you look in the biblical history, where there was change, there was a meeting. Starting out in the first book of the Bible, everything was void and without form. But then it says that they said, let us make a creation. That was a meeting. Down at the Red Sea, when Pharaoh thought he had them hemmed up, they had a meeting. And when they met right and got right, the sea parted. And they went through on dry land. And Pharaoh ended up drowning. But they had a meeting. David had a meeting with five rocks. One for Goliath and four for the rest of his cousins. Because every now and then you got to have a meeting. Over in the valley of dry bones. It looked like nothing could happen. But then there was a meeting. God said to Ezekiel, preach to the bones and watch them come together. And then I'll put spirit on them and they will be the hope of the nation. In the fiery furnace, there was a meeting. Shadrach, Meshach, and that bad Negro. But then there was another one that came in the meeting. When Jesus fed the 5,000, there was a meeting. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a meeting. And the prophets of old got up. There was a meeting at Pentecost. Well, you say, well, I don't, I don't deal with the Bible. Well, come here then. And let's talk about history. In 1852, after the Dred Scott decision, the abolitionists had a meeting. Said, we got to not only talk about slavery, but we got to end slavery. Sojourner Truth and Lucretia Marks helped form the Women's Liberation Movement, and they had a meeting. There was a meeting between the social gospel movement in the late 19, 18, 1800s, and they asked, what would Jesus do? And when they met, the preachers and the labor movement came together. In the 1920s, there was a meeting called the Bonus Marches, and folks started meeting and demanding that they have the wages that they deserve. There was a meeting of black, white, Jewish civil rights lawyers in the 1950s that took down Jim Crow and made separate but equal un unconstitutional. There was a meeting at the lunch counters in Greensboro. There was a meeting on the campus of Shaw University and Bennett College and North Carolina Central. There was a meeting in Birmingham, Alabama, started out with 40 people. But by the end of it, uh, uh, Bill O'Connor was taken down and civil rights was lifted up. There was a meeting in 1965. 
in Selma. And they marched from Selma to Montgomery. And a, and a president that said he wasn't going to sign a voting rights bill ended up signing a voting rights bill. When Cesar Chavez was allowed, the farm workers had a meeting. All these meetings were designed to change the heart of the nation. And I'm finished, but when my tradition, we used to sing something, got a hold of me. Oh, yes, it did. I went to the meeting one night, and my heart wasn't right. Something got a hold of me. And I stopped by to tell you, it's time for a meeting. Children got to be saved. It's time for a meeting. Do I have a witness here? We got to change this nation. It's time for a meeting. Sick folk got to be healed. It's time for a heart transplant. It's time for a meeting. Low wage workers got to be paid. It's time for a meeting. Housing for everybody. It's time for a meeting. Save the environment. It's time for a meeting. Indigenous people got to be treated right. Even on the reservation, it's time for a meeting. Immigration reform, it's time for a meeting. Treating my LGBTQ friends right, it's time for a meeting. Voting rights must be expanded, it's time for a meeting. We gotta stop spending so much money to blow up the world and spend work more money to peel up the world. It's time for a meeting. We gotta stop using religion for hate and start using religion for love. It's time for a meeting. Are you ready for the meeting? Are you organizing for the meeting? Are you going to get on the bus for the meeting? Are you coming to the meeting? Every state, are you going to be there for the meeting? I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'm getting older now. My knees are hurting. This disease is trying to take my life. But as long as I got breath in my body, I'm going to the meeting. Are you going to be there at the meeting? And God says, if we have a meeting, I'll help you. I'll bless you. I'll give you power to change this nation. I'll give you power to take out a stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. But first, but first, but first, there's got to be a meeting. Do I have a witness? Are you coming? Are you going? Are you organizing for a meeting? Somebody say yes! 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 I'll be at the meeting! I want you to organize. Tell everybody you know. Send a tweet everywhere, Twitter everywhere. Hook up in the arm, don't touch, but be COVID safe. And get somebody, come here y'all, in the elbows. Get somebody in the elbows. Be COVID safe, but get somebody in the elbow and say, you better come on here. If I got to drag you, we gonna have a meeting. We gonna have a meeting. America's gonna be better. We're going to have a meeting, and the meeting is going to signal a movement, and we're not going to stop until there's a transplant of the heart. Raise your sign, raise your hand if you're going to organize. Raise your hand. Where the music at? Raise your hand. Raise your, your signs if you're going to use those pledge cards. Raise your signs if you're going to tweet everybody you know, if you're going to email everybody you know. If you're going to call everybody you know, raise them high. Raise them high. It's time to go to the meeting. Come on and wave them. So everybody can see them. Come on here, come on here. There's a meeting up in Washington. I belong. Oh, yes, 
Buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita interpretación esta noche, tenemos el programa también en español, gracias a nuestros y nuestras excelentes intérpretes. Entonces, por favor, si alguien necesita interpretación al español, acérquese a nuestros intérpretes en esta esquina y les ponemos equipo. Thank you to our interpreters. the same because the way we do music in the campaign is that we need all of you everyone in this room to lift up your voice right. and to sing with us because we need not only the folks here in this room to be filled we need all the folks out on those streets all across Wisconsin all across the Midwest all over the country to be filled with the spirit that we are bringing here tonight how do I how are you feeling about that yeah in the music, in the movement, is a justice jump in choir that we're gonna build right here tonight. And so, who are my sopranos in the room? Any sopranos that wanna come sing with me? I feel everyone being real shy, right? Right now, right, right now, right, right now. Just a few people. We need just the energy of your willingness to be up here. Thank you, Elizabeth, yay! We got Elizabeth coming up in the room. That's right. Anyone that just loves singing in your car in the shower, that's the energy I actually need right now. Yes, yeah. please, come up and join us. All right, and if 
any of you feel inspired as we're singing up here, you can come up and join us too. And this morning I know I woke up with my mind and the mission to stay on justice. So we are going to open this evening. Yes, thank you. And Reverend Liz just made a very good announcement that if you don't see yourself represented up behind me, we want to fill in and make sure we know we're building a fusion movement. That's right. So we would love to have a few more folks come up here and to make sure that you see yourself represented up on this stage. And so if you don't see someone that looks like you or resonates with you, we would love for you to come up and join us. And I got a beautiful collection of voices up on the stage already. Y'all know this song? I woke up this morning with my mind. That's it. Stay on freedom, on justice. All right, here we go. I woke up this morning with my mind. Here we go. You got me a key. There we go. I woke up this morning with my mind. Nobody gonna turn us around. We ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Ain't gonna let poverty turn us around. Ain't gonna let injustice turn us around. So let's sing this song.
going to let it shine. As poor people, we're told that we have no light inside of us and that there's nothing that we have. But we are leading this movement to end injustice. And so we're each going to take one moment to think about the light that's in each of us and that's in our neighbors. And we're going to let that little light shine. We need some of that jump off choir to join us up here. So a couple more seats got to be filled. Yeah, please, join us. please join us. Please join us. And welcome. Welcome to this mass meeting where we're readying ourselves for a mass poor people's and low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington and to the polls on June 18th. 2022. Are you ready, Wisconsin? Are you ready, Wisconsin? Are you ready, Wisconsin? We want to welcome some of our Poor People's Campaign siblings from Illinois, from Iowa, from Indiana, from Minnesota, from Ohio, and from all across this great state and nation. My name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. I am a daughter of Wisconsin, a proud Milwaukeean, and it's great to be in this state with you all today. Now, Wisconsin, I don't know if you know this, but before this pandemic, there were 2 million 
Wisconsinites who were poor or one health care crisis, one job loss, one small emergency away from economic ruin. That was 49% of our kids, 39% of women, 71% of black people, 62% of Latinx people, and 1.4 million poor white people. And that's right. It's just not right. And it does not have to be that way. So we're here building a movement, a moral movement from the ground up to right these wrongs and to confront systemic racism and poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, militarism, and this false narrative. So we're having a, a mass meeting like those that have come before and the real people that we're here to listen to are folks that are impacted. But before we hear from them, we want to be welcomed to this beautiful house of worship. And so I want to introduce Reverend Mark Fowler, the lead pastor here at the First United Methodist Church. Thank him for welcoming us here and for why he and all of us are getting ready for June 18th. So Reverend Mark. Well, I hope uh, we begin that all of you will join me in uh, welcoming uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris home and that you consider this your home for this evening. I'm glad you're here. As you came in uh, tonight, you may have noticed that on the sign outside, uh, it says downtown for good. Like many churches, when downtowns went the way of many downtowns, churches decided to move out to what they considered more fertile fields. And God bless them, and we do, and I worship with them from time to time. But this church saw the need downtown in Madison as a symbol of many downtowns throughout Wisconsin uh, and throughout the country and throughout the world. That it was a downtown that was filled with people that were hidden in the shadows and not recognized by those up the hill, or enough of those up the hill that the numbers that Reverend Dr. Liz talked about continue sadly to increase. And so we want to welcome you to a house of worship that does not simply gather in this beautiful space, but gathers here to join with the spirits of many who have chosen this place to stage advocacy in the world. And so your song is added to their song, which has been a song that we have sung together over many, many, many decades, because we are filled with the hope that is preached by the Poor People's Campaign, recognizing that religious leaders have authenticity when they not only are with, but for the poor the marginalized, and the most needy, and we stand with you. And the more that we stand together, the more that evenings like this are not only filled with determination that this must end and a better world must come, but in the meantime, in the meantime, did you see yourselves what a reunion, what a reunion amongst friends that we have not met yet. And so we're glad that you chose this house to come, a house that is attempting to live into our creed that all means all. And we are grateful that you raise your voices here and in Washington, but that the poor people's movement and the movement for all marginalized people, all ignored people everywhere, is not just for Madison or your hometown or this state or this region or this nation, but it's a great place to start. 
but it is the promise that has been made in the great religions and even amongst those who have no religion but are people of goodwill that we will overcome and one day sit at the same table, not one at the head and one at the foot, but that we will all share the bounty together. But just one final word, uh, and I want to thank the Poor People's Campaign for choosing us. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank my good colleague, Rabbi Bonnie Margulies, who chose us. Would you stand, Bonnie? She too recognized we had good geography, <laughs> and I'm grateful to you. So I want to pull our, our tri-chairs from Wisconsin up to help welcome us to, to this great state. The Poor People's Campaign is a national movement, but it's only national because we're nationalizing state-based movements. And those are led by those that are most impacted, moral leaders and activists and advocates from all across the state. So, so welcome um, uh, Sarah Weintraub, Brittany, and Reverend Ari. Thank you all so much for joining us here tonight. My name is Brittany Reamer. I'm from Wausau, Wisconsin. I'm Sarah Weintraub from Milwaukee. Reverend Ari Douglas from Janesville, Wisconsin. I'm finding it. <laughs> here you go. Yep, yep, I got it right here. Thank you for your patience. Oh, cool. <laughs> Hi, so welcome everyone to the Into Madison, Wisconsin stop of our mobilization tour on the road to the Moral March on Washington, D.C. and to the polls and on June 18th to D.C. <laughs> Tonight we pick up the work of the poor, original Poor People's Campaign started back in 1968 by Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and many other leaders of the poor and dispossessed, including Father James Gropey. I think I said that right? Gropey, sorry. Uh, obviously, I'm not originally from Wisconsin. My apologies. Uh, right here in Wisconsin, like they did, uh, we are fighting the five interlocking injustices of systemic racism, ecological devastation, uh, system, uh, systemic poverty, uh, militarism and the corrupt moral narrative of religious nationalism as well as the lack of health care. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So this evening we are going to hear from speakers from all across the state of Wisconsin as well as Illinois and Iowa about how they're impacted by these interlocking injustices and why they've joined this movement to end poverty in a country with 140 million, nearly half the entire nation, who are poor and low income, including, like Reverend Liz said, two million who are right here in Wisconsin. It's time that we make a real moral and political commitment to democracy, human rights, and values that this country has yet to live up to. And to do so, we must build a powerful movement. That's why we are here today, because we're mobilizing and organizing right here in Madison, in Wausau, in Milwaukee, in Beloit, in Green Bay. We're coming together and building a movement from the North Woods to the Fox Valley, from the Driftless region to our big cities. And we will keep building it tomorrow and the next day and every single day after. So let's move forward together and not one step back to DC on June 18th and to the polls this spring and fall and beyond. That's right. Let's hear it for the leadership of the Poor People's Campaign here in Wisconsin. Let's hear it for everybody that is gathered here tonight. Let's hear it for the folks that are going to testify and come before us and talk about our stories and the solutions that we have at hand. 
Before we hear from folks that are most impacted here in Wisconsin and across other states, we're going to watch a video. We're going to ground ourselves in this, uh, this moral movement that we're building, the way that the rejected are going to lead this justice revival, and then immediately following this, build, the build, this video, the next two voices you'll hear are Mark Denning and uh, Audrey Taylor, uh, who are, are folks from here in Wisconsin who are going to speak um, to, to why we're doing this work and, and why we must keep on fighting towards June 18th and beyond. left versus right. Saving this democracy's possibility is non-negotiable. This is about right versus wrong. And the right time to do right is right now. 140 million people in this nation are poor or one emergency away from economic ruin. But it does not have to be this way. And you look at the diversity in this crowd. This is the America they are afraid of. In the 1960s, Democrats and Republicans stood up together for social justice. It was the right thing then, and it's the right thing now. We know that if Linda Baines Johnson was here, he would be saying, free to vote! Free to vote! The goal of the Poor People's Campaign was to help the poor confront the evils that create poverty. But my father used to tell me, don't piss down my back and tell me it's raining. The government should listen to our voices, no matter our race, citizenship, or how much money we have. We are not lazy. We are exhausted from the endless cycle of poverty. <laughs> We are demanding what is morally fair and just. You need to stop suppressing and regressing and start addressing and resurrecting. So stop messing with our right to vote. We need to make it easier to access the ballot. We need to make it easier to live with dignity and respect without struggling. We didn't take shortcuts when we marched, and we don't deserve to be shorted in this legislation. That's right. My body is tired, my voice is shaky, and my mind is determined. I have done nothing but fight. We know that for democracy to work for us, it has to work for all of us. It has to include all of us. So show, show me, me what, what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. The persistence. The strength and the courage of this movement is what it's about. For the sake of bringing change to all our communities. I want the people to win. <laughs> Take this opportunity in my hand. Change does not come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up. And we recognize as people of faith, this is the work of the church, but it is not only the work of the church. We got a word for the U.S. Senate. Come to Jesus. Oh, no. When we show up and show out, we walk our talk. Together, we are strong. We can protect each other. Yeah. Insurrections never win. Yeah. Only resurrections win. Yeah. And history tells us what we have to do when states work to subvert democracy. We're not going to let them stop us from coming out, and this is our country, and I'm what an American looks like. <laughs> The biggest gun we got, call a ballot box. 
We must rise up as a more army. They're creating an America where everyone counts. We must challenge every weak Democrat, every sorry Republican, every silent independent, that you will not stand in the way of our right to vote. Ain't gonna let nobody turn you around. It's time for the rejected to lead a revival of justice in America. Denning and Audrey Taylor, uh, they're, they're the two folks that are going to start with our testifiers. We have a way of doing things in the Poor People's Campaign, which is that it's often our, our inclination to clap, but folks are telling stories that we don't applaud. So instead of clapping and, and cheering, we want to say somebody's been hurting our people, and we won't be silent anymore. So after each speaker goes, we're going to say, somebody's been hurting our people, and we won't be silent anymore. All right, so Mark Denning. Oh, okay. Audrey. Good evening, everyone. My name is Audrey Taylor and I'm the leader in the fight for 15, and we are here to join the Poor People Campaign. I am a mother of two, a grandmother of two. I have worked for Wendy's off and on since 1995 until now. During that time, <clears throat> I have made only $8.25 per hour. That wage didn't support me and my babies. And now that I'm a grandma, it don't do nothing for us now. It's even harder to be exact. Gas prices have went up, food prices have went up, lights, water bill, but we don't have no kind of money for leisure. We can't go to the movie. We really can't go out and shop, buy an outfit, a pair of shoes, or whatever the case may be. But guess what is going up? Hmm. our wages. Trying to pay rent, keep the light on, pay our water bill, put food on the table, it's hard. And like I said, it leaves no room for leisure time. Being in the fight for 15 has brought me awareness about a lot of things that is, that's been going on. But in the fight for 15, it stands for something. People who are working, we are the ones who do the work and make the money. Not the people in, in <clears throat> excuse me, not the CEO. They sit back, they wait for us to bring the money in. We are the people who's in the forefront, the cashiers, the poor people, what they're doing. They sit back with their legs crossed, hitting their bank account, checking their money. But we're not. We're still trying to find a way to make more money. If it means going out trying to find a second job, <clears throat> maybe a third, who knows? They don't care. We're not just here for the people who work for the fast food restaurants. We are here for people who work in the nursing home, security guards, anyone that's trying to be out there to make a paycheck. Things need to change. We come together in America to look for the most vulnerable in our community. Like we said in the campaign, when we lift from the bottom, everyone rise. I, I believe in the Poor People Campaign. It's important to me because it's a reality and I'm poor. I don't, I don't have thousands or millions in my bank account. I work hard every day to make ends meet. 
So I understand the Poor People Campaign. And all about, and I will keep fighting with the Poor People Campaign until we all have what we want. Things I'm going to say today is about mental health, depression, and suicide. So, anybody in here who's living in that place of risk, I'm going to ask you to leave because it's going to get very truthful and, and, and very, very real. And how's that chance? And, uh, I'm going to ask you to come up here for a moment, the person that brought me up, because when we ask indigenous people to speak, Sarah, we give them tobacco. That's a, a sacred plant. There's someone here who's keeping time, and I'm respectful of that time. I'm only going to go, and when that says stop, I'm going to stop right there. I'm not going to finish my thought, I'm not going to do any of that, because these people deserve their respect. So if you could come up here for a second. And I wanted this to, to do this while people made their way out of here. Okay. I'll give that to you. And then I'll ask you to get back. No way to you and way Morgan do come. Not a way but nazi indigenous cause me and no them. Anishinaabe, Omen Omen Lake, Lenape, Delaware, Mohicanock, French, English, and Dow, Neopit, Indonjaba, the place I am from. I was asked here today by your ally in Milwaukee to give an indigenous perspective. And that perspective today is on mental health and suicide. I am the nephew of Badwebudan Benesi Aban. His name is, you know him as Eddie Benton Bene, the Grand Chief of the Three Fire Society and a founder, one of the founders of the American Indian Movement. He is the one that named me and asked me within our Grand Medicine Lodge of Medellin people. That means the way of the heart. We were at the center of every one of our villages and considered medicine people and speakers. And so what I came here today to share with you is my short story. When I came here, it was very difficult. My daughter's last home, three and a half blocks from here. And that was the very first place I went. I cannot represent all indigenous people. What and who I represent in the Three Fires Monday when is to lift and carry my responsibilities to speak for the dead and the unborn, the voiceless, one of our most sacred trusts. Our prophecies speak of a fork in the road now, the end of the seventh generation and the beginning of the eighth. The destroyer waits impatient at the end of one of those forks. And a true and just life waits on the other. This path, this spiritual place was as the world was intended our great creator intended and gave us all that we need here on earth. And it has been the men that have kept you, the impoverished, from having all that you deserve in life. It is not our great creator. It is not a scarcity in the world that is of pretend. It is of the world of men, the world of the eye. In that way of our great destroyer, who does his job and his mission, is the path of the loneliness of the spirit. Six years ago, our son Taylor, a law school graduate, completed his suicide in Milwaukee. He did everything, 
second generation going to college, law school. He knew his culture. He knew his creation story. He had given his tobacco to be a part of our grand medicine society, the way of the heart. Where he lay, heart were broken across our great turtle island. We mourned for four days and four nights. And on the fourth night, we danced and sang with him. And on the last day, we sang that morning. We danced with them, sang. And when we closed his casket, his brother stood up and said, there should have been crime scene tape around his body. There should have been crime scene tape around his body. His words were a stark reminder that this is the difference between the culture of the I and the culture of the we. In the culture of the I, self-harm, suicide, ideation, and completion falls squarely on the individual. 33 days later, 33 days later, our daughter, a junior at UW-Madison, took her own life just three and a half blocks from this church. A working poor student, a university student, refusing to talk about a brother's suicide, went for help and was turned away. You don't have the insurance. We can't take your visit. Your help is someplace else. 33 days later, the suicide rate for American Indian girl is 139% since 1999. The society of the eye trails of evidence are easily traced. Premeditation is tracked, can be tracked. Deliberate genocidal crimes are recorded against my people. Homicide liability, plain in the historical view from this society. Complicity of economy and healthcare systems leave the poor and fragile unprotected. Racism is a public healthcare issue. The point, suicide is detectable. A reasonable person can draw a line between the intention, complicity, and causation of suicide. Criminal acts, this is either involuntary manslaughter or murder. The culture of the I, the society of the I, the individualism asks, this was an act of an individual. We'll wash our hands of it and say, until we meet again, that can be said with a smile. Two years later, their surviving brother, fueled by friends unknowing and young, himself, UW Madison, went to three credits short of graduation. Opioids pushed by the pill pushers of our United States government, drugs of any sort when people took him to a party, they would see his chair against the wall like that, looking for images of his brother and sister. That was my family. That was our family. The path of individualism for the poor is sure. Individualism leads to the loneliness of the spirit. All of our suicides through all of our communities deserve crime scene tape around every body that falls. That is my truth. That is what I came to say. And our young person <laughs> with the sign, I'm sure I'm over time. I, I didn't see all the words stop. I appreciate your kindness. 
یعنی Greg Lewis, as well as Marianne Olson. And if we could stand together, because we stand together in this mission. You know, where I'm from, when you have a testimony like that, you just say the benediction and go home. Don't like to be behind such a powerful message. But listen, we have other messages. I want to tell you about a city called Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I'm the uh, executive director of Souls to the Poles and I'm a pastor at St. Gabriel's Church of God in Christ. I uh, created an organization called Pastors United, and now I created another organization to add on to all of that called Power to the Poles. And we had a organization do a survey in my community, black community, and they asked 25,000 people if they knew that there was gonna be a mayor election in the city on April 5th, and 92% of them didn't know there was going to be an election. I guess I can't get no amens on that one. But 92% were zombies. Listen, you know, we have to do this thing together because we got to support one another because just like my brother, we all hurting here. And now what's got to happen is you got to forget all that other stuff that happened before. We got to band together and be what we can be for one another. We cannot continue to look down on one another and expect somebody else to look up to you. We have to work together. We got to be side by side. We got to do this and we have to do this now. Listen. Voter suppression is a huge problem right now. It affects all of us, but most of us don't know it. Good food, shelter, clothing, housing, good jobs, crime, our next dollar, that's what is on the minds of most people. We're not thinking about the many ways that people are stopping us from putting other people in place who can help us. Strict voter ID laws, excessive voter purging, failure to accommodate voters with disabilities, barriers to families assisting voters who are homebound, failure to inform formerly incarcerated persons of their voting rights, partisan gerrymandering, exact match requirements for signature or other information, complicated absentee ballot requirements, Sunday voting, souls to the polls, early voting. We have to educate ourselves and help our communities understand that we are in trouble, and if we don't stand up and fight, we're done. Yeah. Now I got a sign talking about stop. Listen, stop letting people do things to you. Start making things happen for you. We can do this if we fight together. And if you're anything like me, man, I'll be biting, scratching, crawling, pulling until I die, until things change. Thank you, everybody. Somebody. Somebody serving our people, and we won't be silent anymore. Hi. I am Mary Ann Olson. I live in 
Oshkosh. I'm married. I have three daughters, three granddaughters who have a sparkle in my heart. And I've been home from prison since June 2017 after serving 67 months. Thank you. I'm an organizer with Expo, Ex-Incarcerated People Organizing. And I want to tell you about the first Expo event that I attended. At that event, I was the only woman who didn't end up homeless when she came out of prison. And there's only one reason. My husband stood by me. If he hadn't, it had been unanimous. We'd have all been homeless. There was no system in place to provide us even the basic human rights. Like, come on, who among us isn't more than our worst choice, right? Y'all need to know another way that I am dehumanized and so many of us are dehumanized in this state and across the country. Because after I served that five and a half years, I still have another 21 years on extended supervision. And I don't know about you, 21 years is not rehabilitation, it's a setup. So for the entire 21 years, I'm going to work like a dog, and I'm going to pay taxes, but I'm not going to be able to vote. Right? Aren't we Americans? Why did we become Americans? We became Americans because 300 years ago, somebody said, you know, this taxation without representation? Nope, not working for me. So am I a citizen or not? I don't feel like a citizen. We're moving backwards in this country. And we need to fix it. And Reverend Bishop said we need to put the heart back in this country. So let's meet in D.C. on June 18th. And let's fix this because we deserve more. Somebody hurting our people. And we won't be silent anymore. Our next two testifiers are Jason Rivera and Joe Peary. Jason's from Wisconsin and Joe is from Illinois. Hello, everybody. My name is Jason. Um, I just want to talk to you about my college experience, essentially. I'm 21. I'm a junior in UW-Madison right now. I remember the drive to Madison for my first year of college, and I was so excited, and I was nervous, and I was like, I just can't wait to, like, you know, be able to, like, live my own college experience, you know? Every small city we pass over here, you know, every, like, economy walk and all that, it was, it was great. I was like, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be a college student. I knew it would be hard, but I also knew it would be worth it one day. I'd have a degree. I'd have a livable wage. I'd have a family, whatever I can do with that. Today, I can say that no one could have prepared me for how difficult it would have been or for how difficult it currently is still. No, not the classes or that long walk up Bascom Hill over there, but just trying to survive. I was lucky to have my tuition fully paid for here by a people program, which helps out students in like Milwaukee and all over Wisconsin. But even with that, I still faced food insecurity and housing insecurity, and even had to drop out of school for a semester because I couldn't make ends meet. The leading response to students like me is go get a job. And you know, I have two right now. I work 30 hours a week as a student full time and I have three during breaks. It's not that I and other students don't want to work, it's that we just don't have 40 hours a day. We don't have 90 hours a week to just go ahead and just work the entire time. <clears throat> it's unfair and immoral to ask kids who just graduated high school to drop their education and work to survive. I wasn't even allowed to vote three years ago. It's, a, uh, it's immoral to ask us to sacrifice our youth to save up money to eat the next day. To those who criticize and say, I've done it and I'm alive, would you do it again? 
you wouldn't. My sophomore year, I lost my state benefits because of a seasonal job I had. And by this point, I was a full-time student still and working, again, 30 hours a week, as I do. <clears throat> losing, my benefit, losing my benefits made it difficult for me to get any food. It sounds terrible, but I was actually rationing out my meals. I was going to McDonald's, cutting a chicken in like four pieces for four days with some rice. No one deserves that. What's even worse at the, is that there are other students out there that have it way worse than I do. You need a degree now to earn a livable wage, yet we make it nearly impossible for those who already have, to, uh, who don't have much to succeed. They want us to succeed, and they don't give us the resources to do that. <clears throat> I don't want to go over too over time here, but I just like to say I'm tired. We're all tired. <clears throat> What's it called? My parents are tired. <laughs> my siblings are tired. What's it called? As a child of an immigrant, trust me, my parents are so tired. We're so tired, and that's why I'm here organizing with everybody else here, and that's why I continue to fight, and that's why I've had to fight all my life. <clears throat> we deserve whatever, whatever we, you know, whatever we're fighting for here. We deserve to have livable wages. We deserve to not be homeless. We deserve to not have to think about what we're going to eat the next day. So, thank you. That's my story. Somebody hurting our people, and we, we won't, won't be silent anymore. anymore. Yeah, I'm Joe Peary from the National Union of the Homeless and the Illinois Union of the Homeless. I'm formerly homeless. I now live in public housing in Chicago's Cabrini Green. Two blocks from me are 440 units of vacant housing. We were promised that people would move out temporarily, the apartments would be renovated, and then people would move back in. Promise broke. Those units have been empty for over 10 years while homeless people die on Chicago streets. Wayne Warren survived the battlefields of Vietnam. He was found frozen to death in one of Chicago's tent cities. This is how the poor are thanked for their service. That's blood on the hands of the Chicago Housing Authority. When we complained, HUD told us they're saving public housing by making it private. What's been the result of that? an explosion in homelessness everywhere. Our lease contains dozens of legalistic ways to deny us basic human rights and to evict us. One part states that we can be evicted for criminal activity without an arrest, without a conviction or proof, making us guilty until proven innocent. A young man who lived in one of those 440 vacant units, who was 16 years old at the time, was arrested because he had a joint in his pocket. The case was thrown out of court, but that then stopped the Chicago Housing Authority from using that part of the lease to threaten his entire family with eviction if they did not remove him from the home. With nowhere to go, the boy became homeless and dropped out of school. Wouldn't you think that child endangerment laws would have been looked at here? This has nothing to do with crime and everything to do with profit because no matter how low the slave wages were that they paid us as factory workers, our rent was only 30 percent of that, which guaranteed them millions. As soon as our cheap labor was no longer needed, the HUD budget was cut and mass evictions began. Realtors were given lucrative contracts to manage like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. If public housing is to become a basic human right, we must remove private realtors from public housing along with their Jim Crow lease and expand affordable housing to all of our homeless brothers and sisters until all of them are housed. Third, reconstruction. Fight for it, because the life you save just might be your very own. Oscar Sanchez from Illinois. Um, just to be very honest, I'm uh, very emotional being here with everyone, sharing their testimonies, very powerful testimonies. I appreciate you. 
Hola, hola. My name is Oscar Sanchez. I participated in a 30-day hunger strike with our coalition made up of community members in the Stop General Iron campaign. And if you aren't able to tell, I am here filled with love and joy, being able to stand in solidarity in the same fight we're facing in Chicago. I'm from the southeast side of Chicago, a low-income black and brown community that has been, for a long time, a sacrifice zone for the city. The mentality we grew up was keep your head low and don't raise any attention. We see our environment and become accepting of it, become familiar with it. But somewhere, all of us come to realization that we are deserving of better. In order to achieve that, we must speak up. Because just because we are poor does not mean we should be treated poorly. We are deserving of a system that is not dependent on the suffering of others. We are deserving of a system that addresses our needs. A system that allows our children and our future to exist without a 30-year life gap expectancy because that's what we're facing in Chicago, comparing the north side to the south side. We constantly fight the sources of trauma in our community, violence that we carry through our lives that shows the difference of the difference, sorry, and violence that shows the difference in our qualities of life. I was raised by an undocumented single mother, and now my mother would always say, no tenemos mucho, pero el mínimo tenemos uno al otro. We don't have much, but at least we have one another. These are the words she said to me every time she dropped me off at a classmate's house, family member's house, neighbor's house, that she was working 40 plus hours a week. She said this every time she would grip my hand going through thrift shops and food pantries and heading to church. So for me, we had everything due to community. My mother and I were never alone. We are never alone. We owe it all to our community, the people constantly fighting for the communities that we deserve. We are not alone in this struggle. We are not alone fighting. Community to me means having, having each other. So when a serial polluter in the city of Chicago created a backdoor deal to move their operations from the north side with a rich white community to the southeast side, a poor black and brown community, we fought. After months of protest, community teachings, we decided to go on a hunger strike. The same people who set up mutual aid systems were at the forefront of this fight. And we put our lives on the line to disrupt the system from doing what it does, disregard our lives. I am here to say, we won. So, I mean, you know the chance, say it with me. Because when the people fight, the people win. And we will continue to fight racism with solidarity. We will continue to fight poverty with solidarity. We will continue to fight. There is no justice without restoration. There is no justice without reparations. We demand justice against the violence that all of our communities face every day. We are fighting for the communities we deserve and we are fighting for restorative justice. Marching to the heartbeats of those before us we are the children of those who challenge the system that is not meant for us. My brothers and sisters, my siblings, I want you to remember this. The promised land is coming, and it will come from our bravery and anger rooted in love and rooted in community. So remember, we have each other. Thank you. Somebody is hurting our people. And we won't be silent anymore. We're going to have some faith leaders join us to share a litany. But isn't it 
powerful. Isn't it powerful when we hear the voices of those, the stories of those, the power of those? And aren't those the stories that we need to hear on center stage for the mass poor people and low wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington into the poll? It sure is. It sure is. So I welcome Rabbi Bonnie, Reverend Carla, Mark Denning, Pastor Peter, and all of us that are gathered here to share in this witness. Throughout our sacred scripture and the world's religious traditions, there is a call to stop depriving the rights of the poor, a prohibition against profiting from pandemic and crisis. There are commandments to pay living wages promptly, to deliver equal protection under the law, to welcome the immigrant neighbor, to provide for the needs of the entire community as we care for the land, air, and water. The moral message of the world's religions is everybody in, nobody out. Everybody has a right to live. When we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. So as those representing the 140 million poor and low-income people in the nation, moral leaders who are pricking the consciousness of the nation, we cry out the words of the movement anthem, somebody's been hurting our people, it's gone on too long, and we won't be silent anymore. We declare it is time for a moral movement that can revive our democracy and fully address poverty and low wages from the bottom up. We commit to assembling and marching on June 18th at the Mass Poor People and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington and to the polls. Join us as we compel the nation to mourn, feel the pain and the power of our people and to see that the path of healing and justice is possible. It's a lot. When 250,000 people die in the richest country in human history, and this was before the million who have died because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't be silent anymore. When nearly half of the country and more than half of our kids live in poverty. We can't be silent anymore. When there are 14 million families who can't afford water, when 55 million folks are gonna lose their right to vote that voted in the 2020 election, When immigrant rights are under attack, Native and Indigenous people are under attack, young people and trans people are under attack, we can't be silent anymore. And so we're gathered here this evening to call for a radical redistribution of political and economic power, to call for a revolution of moral values and to build the power to enact all our demands. We're here, we're called this evening to rise together.
for a mass for people and low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington and to the polls on June 18th. Because if there ever was a time to fight, it is now. Now is the time for poor people and all people to come forward with bold and visionary demands and to sing out and cry out and march on that there's something wrong in this nation. But those who have been rejected are indeed leading a revival. I know we're from different faith traditions in this congregation this evening and people that don't come from a particular faith tradition, but as a Christian preacher, I want to share a favorite Bible verse of mine that comes from 1 Corinthians. I think it speaks to who has the power to build power and to enact change in our world, a power that we have for sure heard this evening in the testimonies that folks have shared, a power that we will hear from that stage on Pennsylvania Avenue on June 18th. The message translation of 1 Corinthians 1 reads, isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks, exploits, and abuses, chose these nobodies to, to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. Now, this isn't the way that society is supposed to work. Politicians, business leaders, lawyers, they're the ones that are supposed to save our world. They're the ones that are supposed to come up with policies and plans that reduce inequality and make society work for everybody, especially the wealthy. It's not the poor, the dispossessed, the beaten, the low wage, the homeless. And people of faith, religious leaders, are supposed to preach the good news of wealth and prosperity to the rich and then preach to the poor, there'll be pie in the sky when you die. But that's a lie. After all, the message of the gospel and the message of our movement is that it is possible, it is necessary to end systemic racism and poverty and the destruction of our environment and the militarization of our communities and that it is poor and low-income people who will show the way to that transformation, to that reconstruction. We learned this from a deep history in this country and in this state that has produced generations of abolitionists, women suffragists, union organizers, all forms of freedom fighters. And we know it to the very core of our soul. As Dr. King and others announced the Poor People's Campaign of 1968, a campaign that we still must finish. He said, the dispossessed of this nation live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize against the structures through which the society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. There are millions 
of poor people in this country who have very little, even nothing to lose, if they can be helped to take action together, they will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. We live in a time of great suffering and loss. So much of what is going on just doesn't make sense. How is it that we throw away more food in this country alone, not just to feed everyone hungry here, but across the world? And yet half of our kids go to bed hungry in this rich nation. Here in Wisconsin, we've seen concerted attacks on voting rights, families struggling with the lack of health care and low wages. We've heard about rising homelessness, the mistreatment of immigrants and indigenous people and tribes. In this region, there's the pollution of air and water and land. So we must commit to uniting the nobodies building a moral fusion movement, organizing and uniting people across all the lines that divide us, showing that another world is possible, that poverty and oppression are not inevitable, and that all people, all people, all people have dignity, yes. not that some life right. is more sacred than others. So we must build power, and that's what we're doing. The power to declare everybody in, nobody out. 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 Everybody in. Nobody out. We're going to watch a, one last short video to see the power of people. Then the next voice you'll, you'll hear after that video is Reverend Dr. Alvin O'Neill Jackson, the executive director of the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington. From there, we'll call on all of us to get involved. Forward together. Okay, let's watch something while we're getting ready for the video. If uh, the organizers, the ushers would, if, if you don't have a pledge card, as we're getting ready for the video, if you just raise your hand, slip your hand up, and we'll get you a pledge card. This is the part that everybody gets a chance to participate in. So if, if you don't have a pledge card, many of you got them as you were coming in. Uh, some didn't, so just raise your hand. And uh, down front here, uh, there are a couple of hands, some hands down. So, so the video is coming. And we're going to all have our pledge cards in hand soon. We're almost at the end of our program tonight. We must be honest about the foundations of the political and economic systems we call America. I love America because of her potential. But I know that America will never even get close to being a more perfect nation until we are honest about the politics of rejection. I want to tell you about some of the leaders who are building the Poor People's Campaign. Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama, who had to bury her daughter, Venus, because she didn't have health care. I'm here today to share my daughter Venus's story. Venus discovered a small lump in her breast. She wasn't insured. Venus had to be approved for every prescription and every piece of medical equipment that she needed. I'm standing here today in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign because no one 
them to bury their child in America because they don't have health care. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. I'm a second generation fast food worker and I've experienced the cycle of poverty firsthand. Growing up, I watched my mother endure long hours of back-breaking labor, doing everything she could to feed me and my sisters. My employer barely pays me enough to pay rent and utilities, let alone the medical expenses with my mother. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My only ch chance of going to college was joining the Army. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. Now I'm also a Kansas farmer's wife. Kansas farmers are committing suicide at a far greater rate than the national average. Why? Because they're stressed out. They're stressed out. They're usually in debt up to their eyeballs because they can't pay for all the equipment that it takes to run a farm. And they're usually, they're in the most dangerous line of work there is, yet they, many can't afford to buy health insurance. We have no hospital. We are in a food desert. We have one grocery store for the whole county. Our neighbor, my husband's uncle, still drinks pond water self-treated with chlorine. He had to have a kidney removed at age 64. And the year before that, his wife died of some unknown cancer. Hi, my name is Pamela Rush. I'm from Niles County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. And I got raw sewers. I don't have no, no money on power. And I had to travel back and forth to Birmingham to take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have a car and don't have no way to take her. This is the largest encampment in Aberdeen. There's about 1,000 people in a town of 16,000 who are homeless. In my community, we were all shut off for the day because none of us could afford our water bills. In the past, my family wasn't able to afford electricity in the winter. It was very hard on all of us. But the indigenous people in the surrounding communities that are being affected, we talk about health care. We talk about worrying about the environment. But yet when they're allowing open pit mines and um, letting it leak into the land, into the water, the high rate of cancer and the high bills of health is going to continue to raise because of corporations and greeds and politicians that don't want to listen. There's a new chemical company that's producing another carcinogen in our community, it's amazing. The people who uh, just started dying of cancer. And when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, I was amazed at the black women that would ring our doorbell and walk in the door and pull a wig off to show my wife that I have it too. This wall, this is sin of the highest form. I put my life on the line at 17 years old to uh, defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And right now where we have, we have domestic enemies right here. When there are 38 million poor children, when 60% of African Americans are poor, when 65% of Latinx are poor, when 40% of Asians are poor, when there are 67 million poor white people, we must say, this is not right. Somebody's hurting our people, and it's gone on too long, and we won't be silent. 
brothers and sisters are sleeping on the street. For a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and it's wrong. Our backs are against the wall and we got no choice but to push. We lift our voices for justice. We put our bodies on the line for mercy. And together we will proclaim liberty throughout the land for the enslaved, for the poor, and for us all. Yeah. Followed that breaking news in Albany where a large group of protesters have moved into the street. Washington Avenue between City Hall and Lark Street closed down. Protesters with the Poor People's Campaign of Indiana. Two o'clock on the East Coast. Two o'clock in the middle, two o'clock on the west coast. A wave, and the historians tell us it's never happened before. Our communities, Muslim communities, who have joined the Poor People's Campaign, you can count on us. Our democracy is in trouble. Our democracy is in trouble. And we come to demand. And we come to demand. I cannot stand here and claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and be silent about the moral outrage that is going on in our country. Because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. No one is listening. We write letters, we make calls. No one is listening. So we got to make our, find a way to make ourselves heard. We are the Poor People's Campaign. A national call for moral revival. And we... are here. We are poor. We are clergy. And we're here to say to our nation's capital and to the highest court of this land that everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to learn. Everybody has a right to love. Everybody has a right to live in wages. Everybody has a right to vote. Everybody has a right to thrive, to thrive in this society. Six of the Kentucky State Constitution okay. that says we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. We demand the right to vote. The right to vote. The right to vote. Before the You know, if I was in another setting, I would say, let the church say amen. But I, and I think you can do that even here, can't you? Well, this has been a good day. This has been a good day in Wisconsin. This has been a good day in Madison. And uh, so sisters and brothers, family, friends, all, we say thank you to our co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II in North Carolina tonight, our tri-chairs, uh, Wisconsin, and the other states that have come and joined us. We say thank you to our host pastor, Reverend Fowler, who has opened the doors of this beautiful place. All of you tonight and all of you gathered online all across the country, I am Alvin O'Neill Jackson, native of the Mississippi Delta. Is my friend Jane still here? Jane must have left. I, I found a wonderful friend uh, from, uh, who knows all about Indianola and Sunflower County, Mississippi. But I'm a retired pastor in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Well, I was retired, but I've been rehired. And I'm fired up and I'm ready to go. I'm uh, old and sometimes slow. I've Lost all of my hair, you could call me G.I. Joe too, but don't slap me, somebody will get that. I have suited up, I have suited up, rolled up my sleeves, retired, rehired, and fired up, 
and ready to go. And I've come tonight to ask you a question. As we end our evening tonight, I have a question. Are you ready for the meeting? Yes. Are you ready for the meeting? Yes. We are getting ready for a meeting. We've got to have a meeting. We need a meeting. And so are you ready for the meeting? The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is calling the nation together for a meeting. Where? Washington, D.C. When? When? The Mass Poor People's Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington and to the polls June 18. We are coming, but not just for the day, but we are coming June 18th to make a declaration of an ongoing committed moral movement that dares to change the political narrative, build power, and fully address poverty and low wealth from the bottom up. That's what we are doing. And so you go to www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. Everything is there. You can sign up even tonight, fill a bus. Uh, uh, buses already, routes have already been set from Madison and Milwaukee and all places in between. Uh, you can preset a trip that's already been set up uh, and uh, just get on a bus and enjoy the ride. People are coming by bus, by train, by plane, by car. Some are even walking, believe it or not, uh, from the from the from mid-Atlantic area, uh, walking to to Washington D.C. All roads lead to Washington. So there are pledge cards. You have a pledge card in hand. I hope you will take a moment if you've not already fill it out, complete it, say that you're coming to Washington D.C. on June 18th. And then I trust that not only will you sign up and make a commitment to come, but that you will make a commitment to bring somebody else, to encourage somebody else to come. Reverend Liz talked to us today about uh, the woman from the, uh, the march in 1963 who organized some, some 40,000 people. One person organized some 40,000 people for the march on Washington in 1963. You know, and uh, that, that was before email and, you know, all of this stuff we got. So we ought to be able to order, a, you know, a few folks, uh, you know, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20. We, 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 we can do a few folks, can't we? So you sign up and then organize a few folks to come and join us as well. Some of us are even in position maybe to give a little money uh, to make it possible for others to come. We want everybody who wants to be in Washington, D.C. on June the 18th to be able to be there. And so there will be an opportunity tonight as you put your pledge card in, I'm going to ask us to get ready. Maybe our tri chairs, uh, tri chairs, would you come if you are available and maybe take these, uh, these offering trays here and uh, just kind of be ready with them in a few moments, Reverend Ari. That's great. And I'm going to ask you in just a few moments, I'm going to say another word or two, and then in just a few moments, I'm going to ask us all to just kind of, uh, and then the choir is going to come in a moment. And we're going to sing, and we're going to come and place our uh, pledge cards in the offering trays. And uh, we're going to maybe just kind of surround the sanctuary here. And we're going to sing a little bit, and we're just going to kind of go out on that. But as we, as we close tonight, I want to remind you why we're coming to a meeting in Washington, D.C. We're coming because there were 140 million poor and low wealth people before the pandemic, and things have only gotten worse since the pandemic. We're coming uh, because 57 years after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, voting rights are under attack in nearly every state. We're coming because the climate crisis is devastating our communities uh, and our planet while fossil fuel companies are getting tax breaks and poor people are getting sicker every day. We're coming because there's nothing just about a nation that has spent $21 trillion on war, policing, and prisons over the past 
20 years, and none of it has made us safer. Uh, even as the guns and missiles fire in the Ukraine and Europe, none of us are any safer. We are coming for a meeting because our politics are trapped by the lies of scarcity. Scarcity is a lie. There is abundance. The only scarcity there is is the moral will to do what's right. We are coming because we know what it has always taken to bring the nation to higher ground. People coming together. And so we are coming together by the thousands. By the tens of thousands, we will gather in Washington, D.C. when? Just to make sure you're listening, we're coming June 18, demanding that everybody has a right to living wages and health care and decent housing and voting rights and clean air and clean water and quality education and peace. We're coming and we're going to keep on coming until justice rolls down like waters. We're coming and we will keep on coming until what is moral and what is right and what is good and what is fair and what is decent and what is compassionate and what is right and what is righteous includes everybody and falls like an ever flowing stream. We are coming and we're going to keep on coming until the nation does right by everybody. We're coming. When are we coming? Come on, choir, sing. We got some pledge cards. We got some pledge cards. And I'm coming. I'm coming. Fill out your card. I'm coming. And I'm going to bring somebody, if you got an offering, even tonight, to place in the tray. Just come stand down front, uh, try chairs and let everybody come front, and then just make your way back around the sides. And we're going to just surround the sanctuary tonight, and we're going we're gonna to sing with the choir as they lead us and break every chain, break every chain. We're not going to stop until we break every chain that binds us, that binds this nation from doing right by everybody. Break every chain. Everybody, everybody in, nobody out. Everybody in, nobody out. Come on, choir, you sing.